to a Greenville County Library System virtual event. My name is Rachel and I'm the Adult Outreach and Event Coordinator for the Library System. I'm so pleased that you could join us this evening for Gardening in Greenville, Years of Lessons Learned, presented by Greater Greenville Master Gardeners. If you're interested in our other live virtual events, please check out our website, that's greenvillelibrary.org, and then you can check out adult events under our classes and events button to see our full calendar of events. We have so much going on all the time, lots more even this month, so be sure to check that out and register to attend. To check out on-demand videos, classes, and activities, select the adults category under virtual classes and activities. You can also learn more about gardening and sustainability by checking out our seed library page and that's at greenvillelibrary.org slash seed library. So we always say the library is 24 seven when you can access everything through the website as well. If you're interested in checking out gardening materials, please make sure that your library card is up to date. Uh, if it's not, do come and visit us at any library location. We'll be happy to get you sorted and ready to go. We look forward to serving you soon. Now, please join me in welcoming our presenter for today, Kathleen Kempe with Greater Greenville Master Gardeners. Thank you, Kathleen. Hello, I am Kathleen Kempe. I want to start out by saying I've been a master gardener since 1999, but that does not make me a great gardener. I am an enthusiastic gardener. And I have learned a lot from some great gardeners. I have also learned a lot by trial and error and mistake. And I want to share my experiences with you tonight to give you a head start because I want you to garden. And if you're new to this area, I, there's a few things I want you to know to encourage you to, to garden here. Gardening keeps you in good physical shape. I believe it helps you maintain good emotional health. And if done correctly, you can actually work with nature and enhance nature and preserve nature. So one thing, um, the, it probably I wanna start with one of the most important things that I know about gardening in Greenville County is that there are excellent gardeners and good sources of information. Uh, we are very lucky to have a, an excellent Clemson Extension Service in Greenville County. And they're the ones that run the Master Gardener Program. And I would encourage any newcomer or anyone interested in gardening to look into the Master Gardener Program. Clemson Extension also, and by the way, this is me, um, also has the Certified Carolina Yard Program. Um, and this program, if you go to the Clemson Extension website, you can click on the application and going through the Carolina Yard process gives you a lot of good ideas on what you can do to your yard to make it nature friendly. This is the address for Clemson Extension and the phone number and um, the, the website to, to go to to learn more about Master Gardener, a lot of other things that Clemson Extension does and the Carolina Yard Program. It can also help put you in contact with people who can answer your gardening questions. First thing you need to know about gardening in Greenville County is the soil. And that is red clay soil. This was our house. Okay, they, and if you drive around Greenville County, they've done this for about 30, 40 years, is they scrape off the topsoil and leave this red clay. And this is my side yard where I eventually put a wildflower meadow. But again, it still makes me cry when I see this because it is 
no topsoil, soil, just hard red clay. The, the clay, the soil in the Carolinas does have good nutritional value, okay? But it makes, it's very hard soil. It's hard to shovel, it's hard to till, it's hard to work on. Um, and the other thing is the red clay soil tends to trap and preserve um, weed seeds for many years. So when you dig in it, you're digging up weed seeds that have been perfectly preserved. And of course they all sprout. So what do you do with this hard red clay? Well, the first thing you've got to do is find out exactly what is in your soil. And that's where Clemson Extension um, comes in. Um, you can go to their office and get a, a sample bag. I don't like to do two trips. So I fill up a plastic bag with about two cups of the red soil and then go and um, fill the bag at Clemson Extension office. And then they mail you a report on what you need to do to your soil. Um, most of the time in this area, you'll need to adjust the pH by adding lime, but again, get the uh, analysis so you know. The other thing that you need to do is add organic materials to the soil to break up that heavy, hard, red clay soil. And that means composting, um, we have never thrown out a vegetable scrap in 20 years. Uh, Clemson Extension and the Master Gardeners and, and the library often will have lessons on how to compost. You mulch and then you work that into the soil. We have never bagged leaves at our place. We gather them and work them back into the soil. And when we dig a hole for a tree or a shrub, my husband wearily pulls out the shovel and the pickaxe. This is the major lesson I have learned about planting things in the red clay soil. And I have killed many a plant before I learned this, is you dig a hole and make sure it's deep enough and big enough. And then when you backfill in, you mix the red clay with some, some good soil, with some mulch, with some green stuff, so with some compost and put that in. Do not just put good soil in. The red clay forms a bowl, okay? And if you just put good soil in, the water seeps through and, and it collects at the bottom of this red clay bowl and, and the roots just rot. So um, my husband doesn't like to hear this, but every time he digs a hole, I say a little deeper, a little wider, and, and we put in that mixture and we, get things to survive now. Um, this is Ron with the shovel and, and um, a persimmon tree that we recently planted and our trees are doing well, but takes a deep hole, it takes a wide hole, takes a mixture of, of good soil and red clay and um, plants in the fall. And I'll talk about that later. The other thing that I need to mention is that we are in a planting zone and folks who come from other places like to bring those plants with them and they don't often do good in, the, in this area. The planting zone map that we all grew up with has been new and improved. Um, they now um, have a much better map to look at to know um, what plants do well. And they've factored in sorry, the extreme weather events 
they factored in urban heat, they factored in elevation. Um, so you can't always plant what you want here. I would love to have an apricot tree. I have planted and killed more apricot trees than I care to think about, um, but I will never have an apricot tree here. So get over it and move on. Now, I did not know when I started to garden how much I would have to deal with animals. I think if I knew about plants, I would be okay. But you have to deal with animals in, in um, the upstate of South Carolina. My yard has actually been certified as a, um, a wildlife habitat. Uh, I'm bird friendly and animal friendly. Um, and I, I have strived to be that. But I think sometimes I've made my yard a bit too friendly for animals. Um, I do not use pesticides or herbicides. And I use certain animals to tell me that my yard is a clean, safe, um, natural environment. And one critter I always look for is the, um, I, I call it the Clemson um, salamander. It is not the Clemson, it's the marbled salamander. The other animal that I look for are, are frogs. And, and we have about five different kinds of frogs on our, our property that I know of. And again, those are telling me that I'm, I'm doing a, a good job. The other thing that I've had to learn to deal with are snakes. And not all snakes are bad. Um, I would have said 20 years ago, the only good snake is a dead snake. But I have learned um, that in South Carolina, you need to know the good snakes from the bad snakes. And the black snake is a good snake. The black snake is a good snake because the black snake eats copperheads. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, it is baby copperhead season, time of year I hate. Grown up copperheads probably know to avoid you, but those little baby copperheads, they're gonna strike at any hand that gets down near them. So um, you want the black snakes because they eat the copperheads. So um, for next two months, watch out for the baby copperheads. And if you see a black snake and um, count yourself lucky because you probably won't see any of the copperheads. Now, when we first moved to South Carolina and had a garden, and we were out here in the Five Forks area, I didn't have any problems with animals eating my plants because there were plenty of vacant land around us. But now that we have subdivision after subdivision after subdivision, these animals have no other place to go to eat. So um, my yard and other yards are now their buffet um, table. And I get turtles uh, munching in my garden. And it's not uncommon for me to come out one morning and just see that the deer and the rabbits have come through and, and eaten everything to the ground. But we are in their backyard and they have no other place to go. And they've never totally wiped me out. So um, I guess I can feed um, a few wild animals. Trees. I don't think I realized how important trees were and how much thought I should give to trees and what trees to plant. They 
play a key role in the balancing of the environment. Um, and they are really the foundation of, of your yard. Not all trees are equal, however. And South Carolina finally has banned the Bradford pear. Um, this is going to go in effect 2024. If you have a Bradford pear on your property, and I would say a lot of people do, um, you do not have to cut it down. But if you do, Clemson University will give you another tree to plant. And um, I would highly recommend giving serious thought to getting rid of, of Bradford pears. They're invasive and they do nothing for the environment. All trees are not equal. And some trees are truly beneficial to nature in this area. The oak trees, the sassafras trees, the maple trees, are all support a variety of bird and insect and, and um, other types of life that um, helps keep your yard um, in balance. It is, if you have a choice, go with something that's going to have a value to nature and wildlife instead of something that is nature sterile. And um, I think that is an important lesson because as we build more subdivisions and have less native natural areas, it's up to our yards to, to fill those, those gaps. I have um, nut trees, hazelnuts. Um, this one year I was able to harvest quite a few. The squirrels have discovered them, so um, I don't get quite as many hazelnuts. Um, I plant persimmons because it's just a beautiful tree. Um, the, the fruit it is apple-like in the beginning and then it gets kind of sherbet-like later on. And in October, um, the leaves fall off and you get these wonderful pumpkin shaped fruits that I just think are perfect. We have apple trees, pear trees, um, mulberry trees, and I, I, I love the fruit um, aspect, getting something other than just leaves off of, of a tree. Instead of bushes, um, uh, landscape bushes, um, I have switched out to a lot of uh, blueberry bushes. And it, blueberries are a beautiful plant. We get tons of blueberries on just a few bushes. You have to make sure that they cross pollinate. So you have to um, take that into consideration. But blueberries are, are just a wonderful um, fruit here and do very well. Trees get big and it seems to be obvious, but I keep making this mistake of, of planting trees um, too close to um, the house or, or an area where I really do not need to have a big tree. If you look at this photograph, I wanted a, a tea olive. I love the smell. I wanted it by the window. Um, didn't know it was going to get so tall and, and um, my husband had to go up and, and trim off half of it so it wouldn't interfere with, with, the, with the gutter. This is an oak tree and 20 years ago you could look out the window and there was the tiny oak tree way in the distance and 20 years later now it is starting to approach the the gutter. So trees get big, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly. Um, just take that into account. 
The other thing I like about trees is dead trees. De dead trees are wonderful for nature and I think they're kind of artistic. So I always try to have a dead tree and unfortunately for me, sometimes that's easier um, than I want on the, on the property. I wouldn't have a big dead tree, but a small dead tree, uh, they last forever in the yard and, and the birds and the bugs just love them. Uh, this is a very sad picture for me. This is our Celeste fig tree. You always think that your trees are going to um, outlive you. You know, you plant a tree, you think your trees live forever, and they don't. And our fig tree died and um, fell over. Our apple and pear trees, which were our first ones we planted, are also aging out. So trees have to be replaced. And of course, that changes the dynamics. And you can see where now we've had to plant some grass where before I, I got by without grass because it was underneath the tree. Probably the thing that most people like to do is plant vegetables. And I do the seedlings. Um, my husband said, I always show him digging a hole with a shovel and he wanted people to know that he, he can dress up and, and look more relaxed. So here he is. We always do the seedlings. We start in February. Um, you have to wait till the soil warms up. I know there's people who plant those tomatoes thinking they're gonna be the first ones on the block to get the tomatoes, but it's the soil temperature. And you just start the seedlings inside and then um, plant them out. Great place to grow squash, peppers, tomatoes, we use soaker hoses, we use mulch, um, and uh, manage to get a um, good vegetable crop. This is a, a late harvest for us. We get the kale, you see the persimmon at the top, tomatoes, tomatillos, peppers, and off to the side there, those are hops. Um, the flour is um, what is used um, to give beer that um, bitter taste. But this is the time of year when all these things come in. And this is kale. Um, I happen to like kale and it's a beautiful flower. Um, I let it go to flower and I'll have these flowers for um, well into December. Um, and then I collect the seed and I'm ready for the next year. Now, it doesn't take much to get more than you can eat um, if you have a garden or, or fruit trees. And this is where Clemson Extension also comes in because they tell you what to do with, with um, your excess fruit. When I was working, it was easy to give things to colleagues, but with COVID and retirement, we've sort of have to do, figure out what to do with all this bounty that comes in. I have found that um, for my blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, um, to make cobbler and then freeze it into serving size. And we've been um, um, enjoying that now and throughout the winter. Also just taking this fruit and freezing it and using it for smoothies. So um, fruit's kind of easy to, to deal with. I have canned tomatoes, that's a little tricky. Clemson offers a course in that, um, but a lot of fruit will freeze and I find that's easier um, to, to deal with. And this is a uh, fig tree. I, I love that fig tree. We would, the figs, um, you get a lot of figs and, and you get a lot of figs at once. And what I will do with these figs when I had a fig tree is I would stew them and then freeze them in, in one cup size um, Ziplocs. 
and then use the stewed figs instead of butter for my chocolate chip cookies that I made in the winter. And it was nutritious chocolate chip cookies. Um, and I think they tasted as good as um, the ones where you use butter. And of course, with the figs, they had no fat. So if you're lucky enough to have all this produce and fruit, there's many creative ways that you can use it and um, be healthy in the process. And here's the hops. Um, they actually um, need to grow up on a, on, on a trellis. Our deck is on the second floor, so it's just perfect. Um, we had a lot of hops and we had friends who made beer and they have all retired from the beer making business. However, hops themselves are very butterfly, butterfly friendly and um, bird friendly. So it's a, just a, a plant that I'll keep for that purpose. Um, I am going to be harvesting plant um, hops this weekend. So if there's any beer makers out there, let me know and, and I'll harvest some and you can pick up some hops and make some um, Greenville County um, IPA. If I have a passion, it is for wild flowers. We, when we first came here, we would drive up to Asheville and I would see along the interstate where the North Carolina Highway Department planted the wildflowers. And when we bought our lot, it has a huge side lot. And I said, I want a wildflower meadow. I just think it would be the most wonderful thing to have a field of flowers and just go waltzing through with the birds singing and the butterflies flirting around. And I want a wildflower meadow. So I got a wildflower meadow and I'm just gonna share at the end of these slides, the next couple of slides, you'll see a list of the flowers that I put. But I just want you to look at um, over the years, my wildflower meadow, just, um, just tons of, of flowers blooming um, everywhere, sort of out of control. There I am and they're probably weeding. Um, different um, times of the summer, different things bloom. Um, it is very, very hard to maintain a wildflower meadow. Um, it looks like it's a, a natural thing, but there's weeds and, and wildflowers compete with each other. So you have to kind of maintain the balance. And as I got older, a meadow became way too hard to, um, con to manage. And now I have I would say a wild flower bed instead of a meadow. But it is real hard for me to, to give up on that just um, enthusiasm of all those flowers blooming and, and just having um, this um, thing in my yard um, from about March to, to November. And oh, by the way, you can see a, a, a little dead tree off to the side there. Um, and this is, you can see how the meadow now is more like, like a, 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 a bed. Now, this is also how a wildflower meadow looks after the um, flowers have bloomed and the seed heads are there and the weeds have taken over. So it's not always that great, beautiful color thing that I love, but um, still wildflower meadow is an awesome thing. These are, are some of the uh, plants that I've had in the wildflower garden over the years, the ones that kind of balance each other out. 
and um, the ones that I'm still keeping in my little wild um, flower bed. In, in the upstate, we are lucky that we can garden all year long. We are also unlucky that we can garden all year long because we don't really get a break. Um, one thing I have recently come to realize, and this is thanks to seminars that the Master Gardeners have put on, is that I have tended to do things at the wrong time of the year. I think most of us are um, in the spring, we walk by the nursery and we see the beautiful colored um, plants and flowers and we buy them and we plant them and we think spring is the time to plant things. And we want all the color and all the excitement during spring. Well, I have given this talk and I always give it in the fall because this is the time that you should plant things. This is the time you should transplant things. And this is the time you should divide up your stuff and, and, and spread it out and replant them. Because it is much easier on a plant to settle in over the fall and winter than it is to endure the shock of our hot and humid summers. Um, I have a lot of native um, um, forest plants and nature does not have one season at which everything pops because animals and insects, they all need something throughout the year. So if you go with what nature plants, you will have things from um, about February and March, all the, all the way to, to winter. This is um, right now, although when, and we just walked through the neighborhood, most people don't have anything blooming. I have my late um, forest plants blooming. Here's my turtle heads and um, my hardy um, begonia and um, my um, um, native aster plants. So, and, and the lantana are blooming as well. So there's lots of things still blooming and, and while I garden all year, I wanna go out and see things blooming and, and um, at their peak at all times of the year. And, and you can do that if you use native plants. Weeds. Oh, I don't think that I realized the one thing I would do more than anything else is weed. Um, sometimes I think I go just weeks. The only thing I do in the garden is, is, is weed. And it's kind of a, a mental um struggle for me to remember to actually walk through the other parts of the garden and see what's blooming and to appreciate because I am just concentrating on the weeds. Um, I have these buckets and practically every day of my life for 20 years, I collected a bucket of weeds um, or two from, from the yard. We were, um, I, we do a lot of traveling and we were in Siberia, um, the Chim Chaka, um, the Chim Kim Chaka. Kim Chaka Peninsula. And um, I, they were getting ready for um, Russia naval days and the submarines were gathering off the coast. And these women um, were starting to weed the flower bed. And I, I, you know, of course, I, I see the buckets, I see the position, <laughs> um, you know, this, this is what I do all the time. So I walked over and sure enough, those weeds were the same weeds 
in Siberia that I've been fighting in, in my yard. Um, weeds are everywhere and, and women pull weeds um, all over this planet. I have also learned that you can't outsmart mother nature. And that's the lesson with the apricot trees. You know, I, not supposed to grow here in the, I just can't get them to grow. I have learned to respect mother nature and her plan. And I also realize I can't do better than mother nature. What the master gardeners and, and a lot of the literature is now really focusing on is a landscape that works with nature, is friendly to nature, is our substitute for the wild areas that we have turned into subdivisions and, and um, um, shopping centers. And, and we've turned to our yards as places to um, plant things that make sense for the environment. And we have found that when we do that, it takes less care. And that is real important to me as I get older. You know, the meadow is now a flower bed and I just can't get down and pull as many weeds as I could before. I can't spread as much mulch as I, I could 20 years ago. So it is important to me to start getting in sync with nature so that the yard can um, get by with a lot less of my involvement. Native plants, I, I'm switching out. I, I wish I had started with them, but I'm definitely going to finish with them. In um, the upstate, we have a very good native plant society. They have an annual sale. Go to their website. The Master Gardeners has a plant sale, and they've gone more and more to the native plants. This is the native um, plum. It's a, a small tree. Um, it's uh, a real, it's kind of a bitter plum, but it's um, when I'm working out in the yard in the early spring, when these come out, it's just nice to grab a handful. Um, they do sprout everywhere because the birds love them. And I will be donating some to the Master Gardener sale. So if you want some, um, go to the um, website and find out what the next sale is going to be. The other thing that I want to stress is that not everyone has a yard that they can just turn over to nature, but I think most people have a few square feet that they can. Um, I got some butterfly friendly plants. I wanted a little butterfly garden. Um, took out a shrub in the corner of the house and just planted those um, plants that are attractive to butterflies. And it's a small little area, but now I've got my own little butterfly garden. And so I, you know, you don't have to think big, you don't have to think wildflower meadow, but you can um, think of a small corner in, in which you're going to give back to nature. Now, I've moaned about, um, weeding and of course my husband moans about digging holes but we do have fun in the yard um, i like to experiment and, and just try new things one thing um, that does very well here are the kind of carnivorous plants and i love my carnivorous plants um, and if you look in the background there you see a, a, a ginger um, I love the smell of the ginger plant. I put these by the front door. So when you come to my house, you smell the ginger, reminds me of the tropics. I had no idea it would do so well here. I do get inspiration from all over. I, my yard sometimes reminds me of a botanical garden rather than, um, 
a, a regular yard. And that's because whenever I travel, I go to botanical gardens. And so I just have picked up on that motif. Um, I do try to control myself. This is the um, Chatuli Garden in Seattle. And I just love the idea of glass and, and plants. Um, and, you know, was just blown away by that and realized that um, I could just put a few glass orbs in my carnivorous plants and that that would be enough for my scale of, of things. Um, that about wraps up my talk. Um, if I put my um, email address up there if you have any questions or, or want those hops, but I'll also try to answer any questions um, you have. Um, I put these penguins up here because my husband and I also give a talk on hiking with penguins. And if you're interested in that, let, let us know. We're going to do something for the Rotary, I think, next week, and they'll let anyone um, listen. Um, we, we like penguins. Okay, I'm done. All right. You're welcome to ask your questions in the chat now, or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask Kathleen questions directly, you can feel free to do that. We did get one question as you were speaking, Kathleen. And um, in the picture where you're showing your harvest from the garden, uh, we noticed some greens in the picture. What kind of greens were those? Those were kale. Kale. Excellent. Kale. Yes, yes. I, I love kale. I'll put kale in everything. Um, my husband's a little less of a fan of kale, but, um, you know, yes. No, that's, that's kale. Great. And then what is the best time? When is the best time to water the garden? Ah, uh, good, good question. Um, and I, I think it depends to what you're talking about. For lawns, the grass, that's a different question than for the vegetables. Um, and we tend, first of all, um, I probably, I don't like to water every day, okay? I just don't think that's a, a natural thing. Um, and so we tend to water around my weeding schedule, which is also probably not the best time to water. Um, I, evening is um, the time when most people water. Um, that's um, also when the copperheads come out. Um, I prefer to water in the morning. Um, right after we finish weeding. I'll do my vegetables. And if I do my lawn, um, that's, that's when I'll do it. Um, you know, um, there's a problem with humidity and fungus and things and different grasses require um, different watering schedules. So for your lawn, check with uh, what's recommended for your lawn. But vegetables, I like to give them a little water just to help them through the hot, hot days. Okay, that's great. Uh, we have another question asking about where can I get seeds for a banana tree? Do you know that one? Ah, no, I don't. Um, good, good question. And I have not seen banana tree seeds or plants, so don't know. Don't know. Mm -hmm. You could um, always um, check the Master Gardener's sale and, of course, go on online or check your favorite nursery. But no, I, I don't know. Um, I tend to stick with very common seeds. Um, and in fact, Five Forks Library, I'll put in a plug, is, is giving out <laughs> seeds tomorrow, I think, from noon to two. That's so nice. if you want some um, vegetable seeds for your vegetable garden or, or flower seeds for next year, this, this is a good time to get them. And I believe they're free. 
Yes, they are free. All you have to do is show your library card. Uh, we don't have banana seeds, but you're right. We have local, <laughs> local vegetable and fruit. I, I will say around our compost bin, we get a lot of very interesting plants. Our um, avocado seeds will sprout. Um, once we had a pineapple sprout, um, you, you know, you never know what you're going to find around a compost bin, but <laughs> so far, no bananas. <laughs> <laughs> we do have one request. Um, if you wouldn't mind, could you go back to your slide with the list of wildflowers? I think yes. we wanted to jot those down. Yes. Great. And, then we'll and I, I will also say over the years, I do collect the seed. And since I now have a much smaller area to reseed, if someone is interested, contact me and I'll be glad to give you um, some seed for you to start your own little uh, wildflower um, patch if you want. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it is amazing to me how aggressive some of these wildflowers were. You always think that they, yeah, yarrow, <laughs> yeah. Um, you always think they're always in comp or um, you know in friendly uh, um, competition. competition with each other. They're ruthless. They, you know. <laughs> Uh, we do have another question about compost. Um, so someone's just starting out and they don't have a compost pile yet. And we're wondering if you could recommend somewhere to buy compost. Well, yeah. Um, and we have, um, uh, we have two compost bins. Okay. And basically um, we, put it in one bin, then we go to the other bin. I seldom empty my compost bin. To me, it's just a way of keeping it out of the landfill. And we will buy compost, um, organic. Again, I, I really do not want any herbicides or pesticides on my, on my property, um, but um, there's a whole variety of those. We get them at Ace and Walmart. Um, by the big bag. Okay, yeah. great. Um, one person's wondering, how do you preserve seeds? If you have seeds left in a packet, how do you preserve them and how long are they actually usable? Ah, and that depends on the seed. I will tell you, I am still using the same basil seed that I had 10 years ago. Um, I have some seed that if I don't use it up the next year, it won't grow, okay? Might as well just throw, throw it out. But um, I store the seeds in the garage and most of them have uh, several years, I would say flower seeds. Um, vegetables, because I'm putting so much effort in the seedling and you know, putting it outside and watering it every day. I tend to buy um, new vegetable seeds. Although the library in Greenville County sometimes give out last year's seeds and I've had good luck with that, but I wouldn't go more than two years out on, on vegetables. But my flower seeds, I know they're several years. Fantastic. Right. And how do you collect seeds from plants when you were talking about your kale plants flowering and then collecting um, them yeah. later? Yeah. And um, this, this is another thing that, uh, you know, years ago we were taught as soon as the flower finishes blooming, cut it off, you know, deadhead. That, that's, you know, you can't have any deadheads in, in your garden. And to collect the seeds, you let the flowers fade and go to seed. And um, then you could collect them. I, um, the kale seed, um, once those cute little yellow flowers fade, you get the little seed pods. And I just get a bag and, and clip the whole stalk and the um, Seeds just fall out of the seed pod and then I just put them back in the ground the next year. 
I also get a lot of volunteer plants too, because when you do that, you know, the seeds are gonna fall and, and grow where they wanna grow. But yeah, um, they're saying now, don't deadhead, let things go to seed, let the birds enjoy them, um, let the leaves fall. Um, you know, don't just um, clean up, you know, in September and October, you know, do that later on. Oh, great advice. Then what do you use to repel mosquitoes without spraying? <laughs> okay. Um, I will, um, yeah. Um, when the only mosquito I deal with are the ones that want to land on me. Okay. So I'm not going to spray the whole yard. And I don't like DEET, although I will use DEET sometimes um, when we are hiking or there's um, concern about ticks. But we have found the lemon eucalyptus and I put it, I, I have a mosquito netting that I use. I put the lemon eucalyptus on my shoulders and on my um, um, pant legs. And, and I, oh, um, I'll, I'll mention that link. And I find that I don't have, uh, we've got no mosquito bites and had no problem. And in fact, I think it's funny because I will hear the mosquitoes come and then do a U-turn. So I, I really think the lemon eucalyptus worked. I will also say um, I always put rubber bands around my pant legs because I've been bitten by fire ants too many times and the um, rubber bands prevent the fire ants from um, and also probably help with ticks if, if there are ticks in the yard. So mm -hmm. I, I, I do not garden glamorously at all. <laughs> No, you garden smart. There's a difference. <laughs> uh, but try what? that lemon eucalyptus. Um, it does stain, you know, but the clothes I'm wearing out in, in, in the yard, you know, that it doesn't matter. That red clay and lemon eucalyptus, you know, the end of every gardening season, I throw away those clothes and get out a new set the next year. <laughs> Um, we have another question about um, preserving seeds for the next season. Um, what type of vegetables produce seeds that you can collect and use the next year? Okay, um, I will do the um, winter, squ winter squash, um, the butternut squash, the acorn squash. I do those seeds. Um, peppers, um, hot peppers, bell peppers, those seeds do very well. I, I don't do tomatoes. I don't do cucumbers. Um, the summer squashes, I don't, not the um, zucchini or the yellow crookneck. Um, tomatillos, interestingly enough, um, those seeds um, do very well. And I actually get a lot of volunteer tomatillos that I'll just transplant where I want them to be. Right. And, and the kale too. The kale is, is, is one where you just let a few um, go to seed and you will get enough for the next year. And, once and I do have kale seeds. So again, if you come by to get those flower seeds, I'm going to press some kale seeds on you too. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> And do you just store those in little baggies? How do you store them for uh, the next year? I have plastic containers. And I just um, will collect them in big bags. And when they dry, I just kind of quench them down and put them. Um, I think it's impressive in my garage, my, my plastic jars and jugs of, of seeds. It's just something about saving seeds. Yeah. Feels good. I love that. Uh, we have another person asked um, about their their neighbor asked for some cuttings from their raspberry plants. Would now be the time to give them to her? And how do you go about giving cuttings like that? Okay, um, 
I, on raspberries, blackberries, um, I don't do cuttings. I actually just, the plants send up shoots. And so I, I actually dig up the, the, the shoot. Um, I think it's still a little warm to do that, but you can start thinking about doing that. Um, I'm not going to, um, I've got some blackberries I need to move and some other things. I, I'm just weeding right now because I don't want my weeds to go to seed. And in October, I'll start um, donating plants and digging up plants and moving plants. Okay. Um, and then it looks like we've got time for a couple more. Um, how far in advance do you compost to use it for different seasons, vegetable growing? Yeah, um, and I think now is the time, and, and this very good point, I'm glad someone asked that question, is go get your soil analysis now, know what you have to add, and do that over the winter. Because if you add lime, it takes a while for it to, um, as lime doesn't decompose, but to change the pH. If you add in compost, um, we do the winter rye on our vegetable garden and, and then till that in the green. Um, and that's something you have to do now. Um, so see what your soil needs, if it needs nitrogen, if it needs phosphorus, whatever it needs, and add it now, because that will give it a chance to um, balance the pH out over the winter. Great. And if you are interested in more information about your soil, do check out our two recorded videos on soil health exploration. We've got some more information there too. You can plant underwear in your soil and see how healthy it is. So that's a fun activity. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, one last question. Um, you mentioned having blueberry plants around your house. Are they okay through the winter? Um, they are. Um, they do not totally lose their leaves. They lose some. Um, I, I know um, a lot of us live in subdivisions where we have um, covenants and restrictions and people have a certain idea of what a yard should look like. Um, and a blueberry bush is a pretty bush all year long. The, um, I, I think it has a beautiful color change um, and of course the blueberries, um, but you do have to remember they have to cross pollinate. So you need different varieties of, of blueberry bushes. You can't have just, just one. Okay, great. Thank you so much for joining us for Gardening in Greenville County, Years of Lessons Learned. I know I learned a lot. I'm gonna plant some of that lemon eucalyptus right away. <laughs> Thank you for those pro tips, Kathleen. Be sure to register for our next Master Gardener event and that's coming up next month. Um, that's Wednesday, October 13 at 6 p.m. Carolina Fence Gardening. If you're watching this recording after that time, it's also available on this playlist under Gardening and Sustainability. So check that out. Of course, you can always visit our seed library that's permanently located at the Berea branch of the library system. That's open every time that the library is open. Just show your library card and you can check out up to 10 packets of seeds per visit. If you want one more great tip on gardening, be sure to use your library card. Your library card is your ticket to so many free resources, databases, downloadable streaming, like TV, eBooks, audiobooks, and music not to mention the physical resources like books and DVDs. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and sign up for our e-newsletter. That way you can always be informed about what's going on around this library system. Thank you for your time. Thank you to Kathleen and the Greater Greenville Master Gardeners, and we look forward to seeing you at another event soon. Have a good night, everybody.